Thanks, Gavin. Um, it's been a great day. I've, uh, I personally think this is one of the best compass events I've ever been to, actually. I think it's been lively, controversial, edgy, and it's also been good fun. And what I get from it is the stark contrast between the tenor of the debate here and the terms of debate around Westminster over the last few days. Here it's been open, dynamic, pluralistic, free of tribalism and open to all kinds of different voices and contributions. There it's closed, dominated by gangs, often scrambling around to retain a power that's literally draining away. Here we've been going through some issues based around creative possibilities. It's exciting, it's even optimistic. Compare and contrast that to the cynical shuffling of the pack built around personality and image. The political horizon is not to change the world, but literally to get through the next day. <laughs> They've trapped in an out-of-date worldview that offers diminishing returns. Westminster's dried-up calculations are rendered meaningless as the world tilts. Who's in, who's out, who's up, who's down? Who gives a toss, really, when you compare and contrast that with the terms of the day? At the, um, at the uh, PLP Monday night, the, 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 the enduring memory I have of the last couple of weeks is, you know, this fantastically important PLP meeting Monday night. And we get there, and a leading rebel gets up and says, literally says this, and I'll read this out. We've got the right policies. It's the leadership, not the policies that have to change. Now, if I don't know the technical description for a rebel without a cause, but that seems to me <laughs> to be getting pretty close to what, what it should be. <coughs> these so-called rebels that threaten to resign then hang in there for a top job and when they don't get one it's all righteous protests and wild accusations truly dreadful stuff others strap on the political dynamite chuck it the day before an election and a week later apologize for just about everything now call me old-fashioned right but if you're going to be a rebel be a rebel right if you're going to launch a coup launch a coup but please don't then go and apologise when you get caught. Here's the thing. I've got, I've, got this, I've got this image that keeps... I've got this image that keeps repeating myself, and I can't get rid of it. It's, it's, you see, I just can't imagine Che Guevara being led down from the Bolivian mountains by his CIA captors and saying, look, I really didn't mean it, and I'm sorry about the damn brooch. You know what I mean? Dreadful. The least we should demand from our rebels is political conviction. But let's face some reality here. If Labour does blithely carry on, it's doomed. And that's been obvious for longer than some people like to pretend. For the last few years, a lot of people have been talking about problems like rising debt, increasing insecurity, the fragility of big finance. But to hear people in Westminster and beyond, you'd think these current problems just literally fell out of the sky. The same goes for Labour's wipeout at last week's elections. Too many people take comfort of the fact that we've ended up here thanks to some quick reaction to Gordon Brown's premiership. It's almost a type of political transference that's occurring. This denial, unfortunately, it's a bit more complicated than that. Between 2001 and 2004, we lost 4 million votes. In the 10 years after 1997, Labour lost half of its membership. During the same period, the, part, the spine of the Labour Party, its councillor base, was decimated, and last week showed that support for Labour is literally disintegrating. No one should be in any doubt about the gravity of the situation we now face. It's rightly been pointed out that the European elections were the worst position for the party since 1910. But what if the real comparison is not with Labour in the early stages of its ascendancy in 1910, but with the disintegration of the Liberal Party that was occurring at the same time. Those who say this couldn't happen should pause to consider some facts. The collapse of the Liberal Party came within a few short years of the greatest electoral triumph they ever had, the landslide of 1906, and happened at the end of the longest period of Liberal governance ever. The causes were numerous, but some are worth recounting. The Liberals split over a misjudged and costly war. They picked a foolish and unwinnable fight with progressive opinion by opposing votes for women. They alienated their working class basis of support by failing to respond adequately for pressures for social reform. Their senior leaders squabbled and stabbed each other in the back. They left office mired in a sleaze scandal exposed for selling peerages for money. At the general election of 1922, the Liberals became the third party of British politics, where they've remained ever since. 
There is no inexorable law of history that says we are condemned, we are not condemned to the same fate. But nor is it carved in tablets of stone. We must always be, there must always be a Labour Party. Politics today involves a continuous effort to rebuild electoral coalitions and renew the support of the British public. Quite rightly, voters don't believe that they owe political parties a thing, let alone a vote for life. We saw this this week. The message of the European elections is that we have to earn the right to exist by recovering our sense of purpose. If we don't do, we might well be literally witnessing the strange death of a Labour Britain. A new leader without real ideological change is no answer to the problems we face. The idea that it is, is in and, in and of itself symptomatic of the crisis we face. On the other side of politics, the Tories may be in better shape than they've been in years, but they take if they take power, they will face all the same challenges and the same dilemmas. They show little inclination to break with the old orthodoxies, and that will mean misery and division in a country that's already struggling and suffering. Now, this, of course, is a compass conference. And as such, uh, a quote from Gramsci is compulsory. And um, <coughs> Neil told me so. Um, and he once famously said, um, Gramsci, that is, not Neil, he said... Uh, <laughs> when considering periods of profound change, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. It is in this interregnum a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Let's think of a few of the morbid symptoms that we're witnessing. The expenses stangle, the Gurkha debacle, the attempts to privatise the Royal Mail, the banking and housing crises. This is literally our political interregnum. We're at a turning point but the danger is that we fail to grasp this historic moment, and things are tough. Many people have made reference to the million people that voted BNP last week. The Home Office is making contingency plans for civil unrest in this country. There are credible suggestions that unemployment will rise by some 100,000 a month till Christmas. The terms of debate seem inexorably shifting to the right. Across Europe, social democracy is in crisis. In France and Germany, in Italy and the UK, we are we accommodate ourselves to a neoliberal orthodoxy. In doing so, we've lost our values. Literally, we've lost our identity. The self-inflicted crisis of capitalism is only highlighting the weakness of the social democratic left itself. Let's have a closer look at what's happened. 15 September 2008, Lehman Brothers go for Chapter 11 insolvency. The credit crunch threatened to bring literally the whole entire financial system to its knees. The government took decisive action. Gordon Brown rose to the challenge. The firefighting was great. But then what? Then what? No story, no explanation of what happened or why. You remember that sort of request for an apology for the government's role in what happened? That was literally a search for meaning and understanding in the country. Our own culpability in the crisis stops our leaders explaining the very nature of it. It is Gordon Brown when he says, it's good that Gordon Brown when he says, the Washington consensus is dead, but what do we want the new economic regime to look like? The crisis has long since moved out of the financial sector into the real economy, and on the ground it donates something real and urgent. Repossessions, job losses, people struggling day to day to feed the kids, pay the bills. Real palpable fear of what lies ahead. Yet at the same time, as the longer this government has gone on, New Labour has increasingly little to say about these day-to-day -day struggles. Indeed, by 2001, its policies were essentially based on a mythical Middle England, drawn up by pollsters and located somewhere in the southeast, in which affluence was a given. Politics always had to be individualised. A leading cabinet member said that the essential core of the Labour agenda was to give people, allow people to earn and own more. Remember the 2005 manifesto. Quote, your family better off. Quote, your child achieving more. Ch quote, your family treated better and faster. Here was a vision of people only concerned with themselves, with no wish to think in terms of collective experience and mutual regard. Aspiration was about buying more things rather than aspiring to a good society. We assumed it would only respond to a sour, illiberal politics about consuming, rather than deeper ideas of fraternity, of collective experience, and what it is we actually aspire to be as a country. To put this simply, we assume